Yeah, welcome back to Likeable Science. And we have a, the defense of a master's thesis today from Andres Salazar Estrada. Welcome to the show, Andres. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me here. Sure. So uh, not too long ago, a couple of months, I guess it was, you defended yourself um, uh, in, in your master's thesis. Um, at UH uh, SOEST uh, and uh, your committee members and members of the public came around and asked you questions. That's almost, you know, that's really you're getting it from both sides. And because the questions you get from your committee are different than the questions you get from the public that attends and has a whack at you. But what's the difference? You know, if you had to, you know, sort of anticipate the questions, what's the difference between questions from the committee and questions from the public? Uh, well, usually when uh, the, the Q&A portion begins uh, for, let's say, the last 15 minutes that you have allotted uh, for your defense, um, people are usually looking to uh, understand what you just presented a little bit better or clarify certain things or, or see really what, or how this connects to other parts of their research, um, right? Um, for the committee portion that happens after that Q&A, after the, essentially the public, um, the public part, public portion of the defense mm -hmm. uh, finishes. And then they bring you, you meet in a room alone with your committee. Um, and then they just, they ask you questions where um, rather than getting the right answer, like precisely the right answer, you really want to see how your um, how your brain is working, how, what it, what's the path that it's taking to try to understand the question, um, what are you taking into consideration, where your mind is at, especially based on the research that you undertook. Um, so it's a little more, it, you, you don't want to jump the gun on those. You do want to sort of consider uh, the whole wording and the, the context and and then try to give the best answer you can. You know, half the half the battle in these uh, graduate um, papers, you know, uh, master's theses and uh, dissertations, is you have to write well. And uh, boy, if you hand in something with typos, oh, 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 oh my God, it has to be good English. It has to be cogent. It has to be well written, like 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 an English student. Am I right? And that's why. When you talk to a master's, uh, you know, a master's person uh, or a, a PhD, they're they're usually pretty articulate in English, and that's because they had to go around the horn, through the mill, on writing the the paper. Am I right? Yeah. In fact, it's 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 a double edged sword because um, it really after you you, for example, for me, I I defended um, the first week off. The last week of July, I think, um, for the oral presentation, and then I finished writing it in the first week of August. Uh, right? It's it's kind of amusing to um, look back and think about all of the um, all of the words that uh, that I use now, like that are just kind of um, central to my to my thesis, right? To what I wrote, to how I I presented that information. Right, but it's really hard to to kind of let let go of it. That those like very specific terms or um, those ideas and how they were laid out, and it, it it is it is a strange feeling to like start using very um, yeah very specific words to the to the the topic at hand. Right, and now mm -hmm. if I just kind of bring them up in regular conversation. It's 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 strange. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. You know, um, I imagine that sometime before and sometime after, and even now, you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, going through those same what do you want to call it thought channels uh, about writing it and defending it. Am I right? Uh, for a while, yes. Uh, for I think the first maybe month after I defended, um, it was pretty much the same. I I tried to take a break. But I soon realized that I was I was doing the same things that I was before, except without the writing. Right, I was sitting in the same spot with my computer and um, 
have sort of my the same writing setup, the same uh, position, and I don't know my same like iced tea at the same in the same place. And I was like, okay, like I, I'm still just like still going through these motions, even though I'm not I'm not working on it actively. Right, I'm still thinking about it. I'm still um, trying to connect ideas. And yeah, and I try to try to come back and and reread those things. Um, yeah, it's it becomes, it's becomes little... part of you, doesn't it? And if you make a major academic effort that way, write it up, defend it, think about it, um, it becomes part of you. You you know, it's kind of like in, in the center of your identity. The same thing with the dissertation; um, it defines you, at least so far, don't you think? Oh yeah. Absolutely. And, and I felt similarly when I was an undergrad and, and did my uh, senior thesis, right? It is, it's just these, these large portions of your schooling, really, right? It's, it's a whole year, a whole semester, it's maybe many years, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it becomes part of your subconscious almost. Yeah. You, you cannot not think about it. Especially yeah. when you see hear about other people's work, and it's like, hey, how does this connect to what I do? Yeah, right. Or right. what I did, or my big, you in my the big scientific, writing. Yeah, it puts you in the scientific community, which is um, not just at SOAS; it's a community that's global. It's the whole oceanography community in this okay. case, you know, and uh, that's the way it'll be for you, whatever you do. Anyway, the title of your paper was "Effects of Nutrient Supply on Metabolic Rates." In the old, I, I practiced this and now I, I can't remember it. Oleg, oligotrophic, oligotrophic ocean. Okay? Um, and I looked it up, and, and this is my perception of what you were researching. Nutrient supply um, means how much nutrients are in the water um, and whatever they, wherever they come from. And some water has more nutrients than some less. And metabolic rates uh, would actually pertain to the animals in the water and what their metabolism was and how, how fast their metabolism, their metabolic rates were going, which is important, um, you know, both on a natural selection basis and a, I guess a survival basis uh, and a thriving basis. You want to see them have the right. This is my perception, right? You can <laughs> correct everything I say. Um, you want to see them thrive. You want to see them, you know, survive. And, and the oligothrop oligothropic ocean refers to um, the ocean that does not have um, a lot of nutrients, uh, a lot of animal life and plant life. And it would be clear water. It would be like a lake that did not have a lot of nutrients in it. Or uh, this, in this case, it's the oligotrophic ocean. Um, and some parts of the ocean do not have a lot of plant life. So you're experimenting with that. And then you, Start talking about uh, a one-month um, microcosm experiment, which means that you did this in fairly short order, and it's it says to me you did it indoors. That you didn't go out on the ship or anything. You, mm -hmm. you did it indoors, and you did it with a controlled environment, and you controlled it all. You had to stand by your experimental equipment um, like every day and measure everything and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, so how close am I? Can you help me define your experiment and your paper better than that? Uh, that was pretty close, Jay, especially for just having the um, the title on and, and the picture. So um, yes, the, the full title of my uh, thesis is the effects of nutrient supply on metabolic rates in the oligotrophic ocean, uh, insights from um, large scale and long term um, Miso microcosm, microcosm experiment, incubation experiment. Um, so when I say metabolic rates, I'm really talking about the rates of photosynthesis and the rates of respiration for the microbial community that is in the surface water. So like you were saying, the oligotrophic, oligotrophic waters are uh, defined as, some people call them the, the oceanic deserts, where there is, uh, they're very far from land, there are not very many inputs of, of nutrients, right? Uh, as for example, river, rivers um, supply nutrients to coastal, to coastal oceans, right? 
um, Hawaii is in the middle of one of the largest of those ecosystems, being the North Pacific, North Pacific, North Pacific gyre. Um, so we have been as oceanographers, particularly in the work of Dave Carl and the Hawaiian Ocean Time series, uh, along with a lot of collaborators, has been to uh, understand how these really large areas of the ocean be, uh, behave now, how they behave, uh, how they vary throughout the year, through the throughout the years, through the seasons, through the decades, um, right? So trying yeah. to understand. Why do yes. we care? Why do we care? Because these are, um, like I was saying, um, about 70% 70, 70 of the, the surface of the oceans is oligotrophic. Um, about half of all of the oxygen uh, that is um, present in the atmosphere comes from the ocean. So uh, um, one of the, the shorthands that we like to use is that every other breath you take comes from microbes from the ocean, right? Oceanic plants, uh, unicellular plants that are conducting photosynthesis, right? And this, this happens not because there's, there, there are more biomass, right? There's, there's more of them than there, there are trees. In fact, there's, I think it's less than 1% if you compare them by weight, how much biomass there's on land compared to the ocean. But since these areas are so vast, uh, right, they, they take up a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. And in particular, this area being so big, the North Pacific, um, trying to understand it, how it reacts to uh, disturbances or how just it behaves throughout the seasons is really important for us particularly thinking about um, carbon, the carbon cycle and how much carbon dioxide is going into the water, how much is actually staying there, how much is coming back as carbon dioxide, how much is sedimenting to the bottom of the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. There's something called eutrophic also. Yes. There's many trophics out there. Um, so what, um, so what, what kind of trophic did you prefer, you know, in, term, in terms of creating an environment that's beneficial? Um, well, there needs to be a balance, right? Um, that is what we really want, um, not to really manipulate these, these cycles or these, um, these processes, but to sort of um, take a deeper look and see how they work, see how they behave, see how they deviate from the norm that we have assumed, because like I said, they call these uh, oligotrophic waters with very little chlorophyll, right? Very little um, biomass. Um, so they work at very low rates. Um, but on the chance that they do get uh, a surge of nutrients, for example, of nitrogen, um, they will change their behavior, right? And that's part of what my research was trying to see. Um, as part of this larger collaboration with other universities um, about how, if we had all of these different tanks, right? We had 24 of those, the tanks shown in the image. Those tanks, the, those are tanks? Mm -hmm. It looks like little pup tents. Um, can you explain how the tank works? So the tank is about um, 30 gallons, right? And we had 24 of them. Each of them was filled with about, I would say maybe 25, well, close to actually really close to the 30 gallons of uh, whole surface seawater. That means that it had everything, every little bug. The experiment was called Perifix and it was led by uh, the John Lab at USC in particular, in particular by Emily Seelan and Emily Townsend, who you can see there in the top right. Um, and the main goal, as I was saying, was trying to see what were the effects of supplying nutrients to a uh, a natural community, right? A natural oligotrophic community who's not used to having uh, all of these nutrients. Uh, this happened in August through September of 2021. And on that, on that date, on August 9th, at night, about 10,000 liters of the whole seawater were taken from, from the surface, about 13 miles uh, south of uh, Honolulu Harbor. This then was brought onshore onto the University of Hawaii Marine Center. Um, Pier 35, and allocated into 24 of those tanks that we see, and we also see them here on the on that diagram on the bottom right. 
Mm -hmm. um, and each one of these had its own light source and they had an own, their own magnetic steer so we could like switch everything in there. But um, these 24 tanks were given eight different treatments of nutrients. So some of them got nitrogen, some of them got phosphorus, some of them got iron. And then they got all of the combinations uh, of those, including one that we call the control, which had, had no additions. Mm -hmm. right? And in so this way- But all the other, all the other um, um, elements, for, you know, um, experimental factors for the tanks were the same. In other words, the only thing that you were changing among the 24 tanks was um, the, the kind of nutrients you were supplying. That's it. Exactly. And, and, and the water was presumably all the same because it was all taken from the same area. Right? Exactly. Um, you know, they, they used to say you are what you eat. But uh, looking at and listening to you, I realized that it's not as simple as you are what you eat. Your metabolic rate determines what you eat. Um, so if, if I feed a human being certain kinds of nutrients, certain kinds of foods, I get a completely different result. Um, I can make you uh, fat or skinny. I can speed up your metabolism or slow it down. Um, and uh, different foods to have a different result. And it's the same thing here. It's like you're giving it a different kind of food, and then you're measuring how um, you know these these animals or um, flora, fauna, whatever you're testing, um, you know, react to those nutrients. So what did you, did you find what I think that the more nutrients you give, the higher the metabolic rate? Is that, can I say that as a conclusion? Um, no, you would have to actually qualify a little bit. Uh, the effect of each one of those that I uh, mentioned before, nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron, were completely different, even um, when they were uh, uh, provided together. So for example, here now I have, uh, this is a little bit more technical, but we have the length of the experiment with all of the dates on the X axis. Uh, on the Y axis here, I have micromoles of oxygen per liter per hour, which is really the rate at which they are photosynthesizing on, on both the left and on the right. Um, the points that we see are the mean, and the standard deviation are in the error bars for the three tanks of, of every treatment, right? And I also have the, what I call the totes in a blue, in a blue cross, uh, which are the measurements from the day that that water was collected uh, offshore Honolulu. So what we see here is that on August 9th, the nutrients started being uh, provided, and we can see that there's a big separation between the treatments that received nitrogen and the treatments that did not receive nitrogen, which that really shows us that the proximate limiting nutrient, I means the nutrient that is really limiting this metabolic activity, the photosynthesis, was nitrogen in, in these waters, right? For the community, for the microbial community that was present. So why did you limit the experiment to one month? Would you have learned more if you did it for six months or a year? And why did you limit it to 24 tanks of that particular size? Would you have learned more if the tanks were bigger or there were more of them? Um, the number, the number is, um, is relative, right? Depending on how many treatments we have. Um, and here, part of the design that was done by the, by the John lab, uh, we thought that the 24 was good, um, particularly because of the, the logistics of having to do it, um, having to build everything. Like I said, this was really spearheaded by um, the Emily's at the John Lab and the rest of them who physically built all of this. They set up the tent, they did all the sampling, the subsampling. Um, and in fact, 30, we, we called it, like I said, in the, in the full title of my, of my thesis, we call it a long-term and large-scale uh, experiment because we usually don't have uh, incubation experiments that are this long. The mm -hmm. Hawaii Ocean Time Series, uh, a large part of its power is the fact that it, it's been going on since 1988. Right? We have a lot of data to interpret, to interpret between seasons, between years, between decades. Um, but for 
monitoring that is this for the, a resolution. We're sampling, we're sampling every three days, every other day. Um, and we really want to see a quick effect. Um, these, these experiments usually only last a, a week or two. So by making it a month, we actually did see, um, we got to see more of, the, of how the community reacted. Yeah, talk about reaction. Can we see those charts one more time? The, the, so the charts reflect changes um, what by by the day huh? or by yeah, every, every of days. I sampled every I sampled twice a week. Yeah. Okay, and, so and so that means there's something days. something you know profound is happening um, that oh, yes. you can you can see the changes uh, every time you look. It, it's different. And that is quite something. How do you measure, though, the metabolic rates of of the, um, the algae or the flora fauna that you're mm -hmm. testing? How do you do that? Is there a, a little device, a little you stick in the met metabolic rate device, and bingo, it tells you what to put on the chart? I wish. No, uh, it's it's a little more complicated than that. So um, what I did was I sampled. Like I said, twice a week. So uh, every every time I went to sample, I would get one liter out of each of the twenty four um, pericosms, as they were called. Then that one liter, I would separate it into th into three bottles, so three smaller bottles. One of those bottles, I would kill immediately with poison, which would maintain all of the all of the gases that are the dissolved gases that are there, the oxygen, the CO two, et cetera. The second bottle, I would actually spike it. I would give it 650 microliters of uh, water that is enriched in oxygen 18. So H2O, the O, instead of being a, an atom uh, 16 of oxygen, it was an atom 18 uh, of oxygen. And then that one, I would put it in an incubator that was in the same tent, so the same temperature and the same light source as all of the tanks. But then, separated, but separated. Yeah, but separated. Then the third bottle would be what I call the dark bottle, and that I wouldn't do anything to that one, but I would still put it in a in an incubator, but with a lid, so it would not receive any light. Right. Then those two incubations, I would have to wait for them about six hours for them to the well. The first one that had exposed to the light, they, it would photosynthesize and it would respire. Right, it would produce oxygen and it would consume oxygen. Then the th the third bottle, the dark bottle, it wasn't really exposed to light, so there was no oxygen production, only oxygen consumption, which would give us a rate of of respiration of the community. But the fun thing about the the light bottle was that both things are happening. Right, I use the oxygen eighteen to track the production of oxygen when I see how much. Um, how much O2 that it is a molecular weight of 34, right? That's 16 plus 18, right? The 16 being the common, 18 being the, the uncommon one. Then I could use that, the known fraction and the ratio between those isotopes to see how much was the total gross oxygen production. So the total photosynthetic rate for that. Um, and then with, Comparing that to the time zero bottle, right? The one that I killed and like all of the, before the incubation, I poisoned it so there was no microbes would change the oxygen, et cetera. I can tell from, for those six hours, how much oxygen was produced, how much oxygen was consumed uh, in the light bottle and also in the dark bottle. So it gives me also a way to, to separate um, the respiration that the microbial community is undertaking while they are uh, exposed to the light, which is actually something that's um, very difficult to do with mm -hmm. any other method. Oh, you, you killed them? Yes, but, I have uh, to. You didn't put them back where they came from you. Isn't that cruel? A little bit. I do get attached to my little, to my little, my little <laughs> homies. <laughs> my, my, your microscopic animal. <laughs> yeah, which I really, yeah, some people call me a microbiologist, but I really only care about their gases, right? what, they, what they're putting out, what they're putting in, 
Uh, so I don't really spend much time on the microscope as I used to. <laughs> so, you know, it, it strikes me that um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, one is uh, you, you're going to have different results with different animals and different results with different nutrients. Um, so, uh, you know, where, where does it fit in the halls of science that you have all these results? You can have so many results that, you know, it's hard to say what that would teach us in a larger sense. In the larger sense, um, you know, what, what is your contribution in this paper, this experiment, uh, and in defending it? Um, what, what is remarkable that the rest of the scientific world can use? I think one of the biggest um, findings that I have here, which corroborates um, a handful of papers that have come out, is that separation of um, being able to determine the rates of respiration when the mic microbes are exposed to the light and when they are not exposed to the light. Why? Because uh, like we see here on the left, a very similar graph to what I showed with the gross oxygen production, right? Except at this time, the same rates, but it's for oxygen consumption, right? We see that there's still a separation on both of them for light respiration and dark respiration for the treatments that received nitrogen and the treatments that did not receive nitrogen. It is not as visually striking as it is for the oxygen production for the photosynthesis, but it was a statistically significant effect. The difference, though, is that here, light respiration is a lot higher. Well, it's noticeably higher than the rates that we measure for dark respiration. This, in papers that have managed to address this, is, is common. This has been found before. Um, but uh, still throughout uh, oceanography, especially in the what they call biogeochemistry of the surface ocean, a lot of people use the dark method to determine their their respiration estimates to their respiration rates. Uh, and that's really important to constrain properly because when you are producing uh, your gross oxygen production, right, as your gross photosynthesis, and then you have your respiration, you need to make do a balance between those two to determine the what we call the metabolic state of those waters, right? Are they producing more? Are they consuming more? Is, if they are producing more than they're consuming, that means that there's a lot of carbon that could be sequestered, that could be could end up in the oceanic cycle for thousands of years, right? I want to ask you about that. You know, I, I saw on PBS recently a very interesting story about the uh, the redwoods, California, and there are some guys who are taking uh, clippings, uh, cuttings off those redwoods and planting them in other climates where they somehow managed to grow. Why redwoods? Because redwoods generate, um, or use more carbon. They sequester more carbon than mm -hmm. mo most other trees. And a big redwood can really do a job. And so if you plant a lot of redwoods, you're doing something for climate, climate change. Um, and so if you can control um, you know, the whole carbon process in the oligotropic uh, you know, ocean, then maybe you could have an effect on carbon in the world. And am I right to think that maybe what you're doing, learning about um, you know, uh, nutrients and, and different animals and uh, metabolic rates, thriving or not thriving, living or not living, um, could have an effect on the ocean, which is a, a great you know, source of oxygen, um, and sequestering carbon, I think. Um, and so th these, these experiments that you're doing, that you have done, could lead to, what do you want to call it, an artificial change in the ocean um, by giving certain nutrients to certain animals in certain places and letting the ocean change for that. Is, is there that possibility? Um. I personally don't don't think so, Jay. So a lot of these, uh, actually, there have been scientists in the past who have uh, suggested, for example, dumping iron in the Southern Ocean, um, which they would assume would would really 
um, activate all of this uh, photosynthesis and all of this microbial activity, all of this carbon sequestration. But like I was saying before, what we really want to understand is how these systems behave. How do they behave to already their natural disturbances, right? And these disturbances that are going to continue to increase with climate change, right? With the, the change of um, pressure differentials in the atmosphere and the ocean, changes in temperature, changes in how often nutrient pulses occur, occur in the oligotrophic waters. So before we really want to do any of those things or even consider them, we still don't have a good grasp on, on what, like, for example, fertilizing the oceanic desert would do, really. If it would really be um, effective, uh, what kind of scale it would have to happen. And, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of caveats as to what would happen or what could happen if, if we were to manipulate it at a scale that large. Yeah, it could go the wrong direction too. Exactly. It? Yeah. Well, but you're talking about microbes and after all, CMAR stands for the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education with yes. the Ocean Time Series going on for 30 years. And uh, there must be a lot of information already accumulated in the Ocean Time Series about these very points. So why did you select this for your master's thesis? I mean. It, is, is it a master's thesis that, you know, occurred to you, appealed to you, or was this your committee telling you an area that was interesting and, uh, and, and that science needed to hear from you about it? Um, it was a little bit, a little bit of both, right? Well, yeah. coming here, I didn't really have a project in mind, um, but my advisor, Sarah Ferron, she, um, she really developed this, this method of measuring uh, gross oxygen production with a particular um, mass spectrometer. So this method had already been existed using the isotope of oxygen 18 um, since the late 80s, uh, and it has sort of been polished since then. Uh, but she has been using it to measure these metabolic rates in the ocean. So she would take out the mass spectrometer into uh, on the ship and measure them out while they were out there and get the results right away. Um, and working with her, I thought that was really interesting with how we could determine, like I said before, what, what little gases are coming in and out of these, of these little, um, what we call them, uh, redox machines, right? Like reduction oxidation machines, which are these little cells. Uh, and I thought that was fascinating. The deeper that I got into it, um, and the sooner that sort of the deadlines for the thesis <laughs> were looming, uh, I definitely got a lot of help from my committee and sort of like guiding me as to what could be a great opportunity. And luckily, like I said, the, um, the Simon's collaborations of, on ocean process and ecology scope, uh, which is a um, major funder of the Seymour and Hawaii's time series, as well as some of their PIs, um, had this project ongoing that it was going to happen and they needed someone to um, quantify the photosynthesis rates and the respiration rates. So it all really fell into place. Yeah, but uh, it seems to me that a lot of the effort you had to put in was to establish the system, establish the devices you would use, you know, the size of the tanks, the, the various um, experiments that you were conducting, um, both on the nutrients and the animal side. And, um, and furthermore, um, that um, you had to look around for that. You had to do a fair amount of research to just, uh, am I right, to establish um, the experiments, to establish uh, what you were going to use, how you're going to do it, how often you're going to look at it, what data you're going to pull out of it, uh, and so forth. And you know, aside from the data itself and the scientific conclusions you make into the scientific community, you have to have what scientific credibility and reliability of the data. So therefore, you have to use the right equipment and the right, mm, the right systems um, to make this credible for, for science. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's why I cannot give enough credit to uh, the Emily's and the John lab, because they were the ones that designed these, what they call the peri costumes, right? The tanks with the lighting and the stairs uh, and everything. And they tried them out over in California and um, as part of USC in Catalina Island. And they, they did all of these trials and all of this work 
before any of uh, Perifix really happened to make sure that it was ready for all collaborators. Um, right? I think we were about 10 or 12 different laboratories, um, not only in the United States. Were you, were you on the phone to them? Were you emailing them? Yeah, uh, we had, we had um, meetings, right? Online meetings to mm -hmm. sort of go through what everyone was going to do and uh, how the sampling was going to happen. And yeah, the logistics were all handled by. Uh, so Andre, sorry, yeah, right now you're working in, in uh, the same laboratory um, and you're doing experiments. Uh, how close are those experiments related to um, the experiment about which you wrote the thesis? Uh, the work that I'm doing right now is, it has two parts. One of it is, yes, finishing up um, all of the work that I had, that I had done, right? All of the readings, all of the, the writing, some of the writing that I, I may want to add if um, I want to publish, we want, if we want to publish um, these results beyond, uh, beyond being a thesis, right? On a, on a scientific journal. Uh, but at the same time, I have other responsibilities. I actually just was uh, out at sea for about 45 days uh, trying to get some, some samples uh, for my supervisors out on the close to, closer to the equatorial Pacific, just in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and that didn't really have anything to do <laughs> with a metabolic rate, but I love going to sea, so it was a welcome opportunity. <laughs> So what about the future for you? You've taken your master's. Uh, the next uh, benchmark is the PhD. What are your thoughts about that? What subjects might you consider? What's the timeline in taking your PhD these, these days? And what, will you do it at SOAS or somewhere else? Um, so right now, I, I'm not thinking about doing my PhD right away. I've definitely thought about it. I, when I came here, I thought I would go straight through the PhD and just try to sort of um, blast it out to some extent. But uh, particularly with COVID, um, I am originally from Chile on South America. So it, it's been a long time away from home. Uh, it's been a long time in school also, right? Um, so I'm thinking about taking a little bit of a step back, enjoying the work that I that I do, enjoying the science, rather than um, feeling that pressure of writing and producing and and graduating that I had that I had felt before. Uh, so yeah, taking a little bit of a take a little bit of a pause on the academic side, hopefully continuing on the research side, um, and hopefully still related to ocean biogeochemistry. I'm I think. What really fascinates me is how powerful these these little microbes are and what they can do in, in cycling all of these nutrients that have monumental effects. They they matter they matter a lot for our earth. So I yeah. yeah. I'm pretty lucky to be able to to look at the world that way. Yeah, and you're pretty lucky coming from Chile too. Chile is so environmental. It's uh, really uh, aware and conscious of environment as so few countries are. And it's beautiful as you go south, and it's got all this shoreline, all this ocean to look at. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's got astronomy too, doesn't it? Yeah, they do, <laughs> up in the desert. Well, thank you, Andres. Andres Salazar Estrada, uh, who joins us to tell us about the defense of his master's thesis at UH. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn.
and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.